set at the truth. But, you know, that's the only thing I said today. Well, that's nice to meet all of you. It's very nice to meet all so, uh, Dave, I'd like to start with you. Um, you said you were a journalist in your prior life. Um, what what changes have you seen in journalism, both on the reporting end and on the receiving end? Well, I think that uh, for one, with the so so you know with the decline of the news industry in general, uh, that has opened up uh, the opportunity for a lot of. Um, sort of nonprofit groups, groups that would have been political campaigns uh, in the past to represent themselves as journalists and organizations. But unfortunately, we've also have seen like a decrease in the number of publications that are employing fact checkers. Um, and so occasionally, sometimes, you know, errors do get through and reporters will correct them, but that has given an opportunity for, you know, politicians to like, you know, use that term fake news as a hammer. And that may not be fully within the scope of what we're talking about today, um, but certainly, I don't think it's anything new to find people lying and spreading misinformation. Uh, well, I just no wish there, yeah, but I wish there were more more journalists around today to help counteract that. And unfortunately, we're you know fighting a battle where you know journalism isn't as you know sustainable these days, um, and, and that does create problems. Is that what you mean by decline? Is that it's just not sustainable, or that it doesn't? I have think the same well, you know, like you have like you know. Online shopping come up, and there there were less classified ads out Ooh, there. Well, I'm gonna go shop for yeah, something. and 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 so you do see a decline in in you know the size of newspapers, lots of layoffs, lots of people leaving leaving the industry, hard to retain talent over time. It's you know uh, largely an economic thing. Is what is what I mean. I don't mean like like journalism as a whole is just getting crappier. I mean that the industry is getting smaller. So do you think that's a consequence of of the um, of the Quality of the reporting. Or no, the no, absolutely not. I wouldn't um, expect so, so. No, no. I think I think there are very fine journalists out there. I don't think they're getting paid enough, and I think it is hard in this economy to sustain uh, a lot of these reporters who might have been able to buy a house and raise kids and put them through school on their salaries, and now it's more like, you know, you know, live as a monk for five years and then go, you know, become a teacher or go, you know, work in PR or do something else just because you. Know, want to live a full life in the end and not, you know, and have health insurance and retirement funds. And um, have you noticed a difference between the effect of the media? Sure. Like, um, he commented? Well, I, actually, I was just happening to be reading an article the other day that said one of the ten career fields you should not go into is journalism. <laughs> and for exactly that reason, the uh, career field is shrinking. Uh, as we've lost mass media, you know, the, the, this term mass media came around in the 20s. And it was because all your media came through specific channels, right? Whether it be TV, there were ultimately through the 50s, 60s. Uh, I mean, I grew up in New York. Even in New York City, we had three channels. Three channels and a local channel, right? ABC, NBC, CBS, and your local. So all your media was massed either through newspapers or through those. Well, as it turns out, now you have 250 bazillion channels uh, to go through. Your newspapers are at the, publishing at the same level that they did in 1945. So, uh, despite the fact that the company's a lot larger, so media as we have known it, journalism as we have known it, is a dying art. Um, but as for today, I mean, I don't know what it'll evolve to in 10 or 20 years, who knows? But, um, you know, I read Al Jazeera. I don't know what everyone else does, but those domestic things that we have have to compete on a different level now. So. That's changing the entire context of fake news that yet again comes in and plays as a will play as a part of this. And do you see the pledge, the pro treat pledge, um, as being a tool to help improve the quality? I mean, of course, you've got us because you've been better. Yeah, I think the pro treat pledge is definitely a big tool to help us trust in journalism because we. Uh, so the Pro Truth Pledge works, as you can see, there are 12 behaviors that you promise your best to do. And peer-reviewed research has shown that it's effective and people do actually follow these behaviors overall in a statistically significant way. We've had two studies published, as Glove just mentioned. So public figures who sign the Pro Truth Pledge are held to a higher standard. So we have lots of journalists, academics, politicians, professors, uh, all sorts of people hundreds of hundreds of these folks signed and they're publicly displayed on the <laughs> pledge.org website. 
So it really helps to build trust so that if I put out something on Twitter and you put out something on Twitter, you know, people can go and see, did this person sign a pro-truth pledge? There's much more credibility. And this definitely extends to media professionals. So in this kind of life, we're talking about the economy, the incentives, there's some such an overwhelming you know, situation of information. And I actually also grew up in New York City since I was a 12 year old. And so now that it's more, there are more sources and less trust in anything in particular, journalists can differentiate themselves and, and state that they are a sign of the pro-truth pledge and that they will follow these behaviors that, as you can see, and as science has shown, really help us move out of this kind of post-facts, post-truth department. Do, um, so you mentioned that you uh, read Al Jazeera. Do, do, do any of the other folks seem to find uh, international journals or international reporting more reliable or more uh, consistent with what your, your image of what reporting should be? Um, I mean, it, it, I, I don't want to like broadly talk about international media because like we, clearly you look at some of the tabloids in Britain and I wouldn't hold them to any <laughs> standards whatsoever. Well, I'm going to say the underwear, I think, the underwear ads, I think, sell more papers. Sure, sure. <laughs> and, and, and certainly other countries have different standards. You know, you go to Mexico, you'll find a lot of publications that focus on like murder on the covers and things like that. And in a lot of other countries, you know, there are state-run media, and unfortunately sometimes state-run media is the best you can rely upon because they're the only ones with money to send reporters places. Um, so, I, you know, I, I do, do like find a lot of value in reading Al Jazeera's publications. Um, I also find the BBC to be quite reliable in, in, in many regards. A lot of the Canadian publications can be pretty good too. And, you know, certainly in England, like The Guardian is, is, is always somebody I look to for, for reporting. And um, y'all are talking about the authoritarian regime. Can you talk more about that and yeah. context? I'd actually be happy to share a little anecdote that I shared before in some talks I gave of kind of what happens because my parents, there's a reason that my husband's parents separately brought us to the United States as little kids because you know they went through too many hardships and they're like, this is better than that. And so here's an example of an anecdote, a little joke that would go around during the Soviet times is that a dad is sending his kid down to buy a newspaper. And he says, you know, buy the used newspaper for you. And buy the Pravda, the truth newspaper for me. And buy the Evening Star newspaper for your mother. Oh, but dad, mom hates that newspaper. Well, she can wipe her butt with the TV. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of the, the level of trust that was in the media, where you have government media and nothing else which is what was happening in the Soviet Union. So we don't want to go there. But the fact is that I think if we have hundreds and hundreds of media outlets and people still don't trust them, and as we know, <coughs> one can attest with the numbers, the trust in mainstream media is falling. People are turning to social media in increasing numbers. So just like people don't trust the, you know, all the newspapers they use in the bathroom because they don't believe anything that's said, we might end up in the same situation where we have too much news and people don't trust it, and I think that's a very scary place to go. So, thank you. And one of the things we need to recognize right now, we're talking about news, journalism, mainstream journalism. We need to understand fundamentally that our information ecosystem is irreparably broken. I want you to remember those two words, irreparably broken. Mm. We can't go back to where we were. According to recent polling, about 66% of U.S. adults get their news, some or all or most, on social media. Mm -hmm. I'm going to say that again. Over two-thirds of adults in the U.S. rely on social media for their news. So, you know, the people who are posting memes and so on, news articles, that's what's happening. Now, here we're sitting in a room of people who are exceptional. Mm -hmm. We need to understand that we are not like the mainstream public. This is something we have to realize. There's a cognitive bias called failing at other minds. And we all tend to fall into this cognitive bias where we can't effectively imagine how other people think, feel, and behave, and why they feel, think, and behave this way. So there are so many people who use social media as their main source of use. These people, according to research, research shows that people believe about 75 percent of fake news that they hear, according to studies. 
they believe about 80% agree on you that they hear. That's a difference of those of you who did the math for about 7%. <laughs> About 7% difference between real news and fake news on social media. People. So we have a really huge problem. Now, journalism has become very, very diluted as a concept. We're talking about journalism quality. Anyone can go online right now, create a blog, create a website, and call herself or himself a journalist. Your normal person in the mainstream media public, or a consumer of news, would not be able to tell apart this person calls himself or herself a journalism from a reporter from the New York Times or from the Wall Street Journal. The concept of journalism has become diluted. Our information ecosystem is broken. There's no way we can go back to the past. Our democracy is becoming destroyed because people are not relying on the same sources of information for news. Polls show that both Republicans and Democrats, about 75% of the population on both sides, I would say that the population can't agree on basic facts. I'm not saying that they can agree on you know whether we should have gun control or not. They they don't agree on whether you know uh, the temperature is 70 degrees outside. <laughs> that's that's a basic fact. You can look at the thermometer. That they will tell you that the thermometer is fake news. <laughs> we are in a situation where our society is sliding down inevitably toward authoritarianism and corruption. There's no question that's where it's headed. The question is, are we going to do something about it? Or are we just going to sit by the sidelines and laugh at all the people who are sharing fake news and then end up where we're going? Or are we not? And that's a question that's so up to each one, one of us, whether we choose to do something about it or just sit there and laugh at people posting stupid stuff online. Nick definitely has something to say. Yeah, I have to disagree with that. I'll disagree with basic facts first. And then disagree with uh, your, your actually your premise. But it's not simple enough. I mean, it's very simplistic to say everyone's getting their stuff on. And two thirds is a very high figure for social media that I've heard. I've heard significantly less, and that depends a lot when you break it up into age groups, um, how many people and how people get their information from social media. Number one. Okay, so it depends on the age group. Number two. That, that information that they're getting is generally, you know, you see people passing around articles, right? So it's news sources, whether or not you rely on those news sources, whether or not you believe them, but the news sources that are being passed through social media. So the only thing that's really different from you going out and buying the newspaper, watching this on TV, is the delivery. Now you're getting it on your cell phone, right? So it's just a delivery mechanism, so I don't have a real problem with that. But the issue where this becomes important for fake news is in your behavior and the algorithms online, for example, in Facebook and such. Because we know what, what forms this tend to be, what echo chambers, as they're called. Right? So you don't like something, you get rid of it. You get rid of the person, I don't want to see this anymore, I don't want to see Joe anymore. I cut 200 people off my Facebook or more because I was just tired of the arguments. I was exhausted from, from you know, me spending two hours educating on someone who didn't do their basic research on it. Right? Just cut and pasting articles. So um, what happens, though, in this environment is that you tend to shape the news around you. And the algorithms are actually written that way. So Nick wants to see stuff on ABC subjects. That's the stuff he likes. That's the stuff that comes from. So the only thing Nick sees are the things that tend to agree with him. And this is what they're talking about as the danger being just in news that's pushed out. Whether it's real or fake, you actually just start creating a shell around yourself. And this is how the algorithms work for artificial intelligence for putting out information. I mean, the way we knew Russia was monkeying with our elections is because all these um, centers that had been created, for lack of a better term, echo chambers of tens of thousands of people, we saw the distribution happen to those within seconds. So within seconds, a media source would be delivered not just to individuals, but to 10,000 individuals in one of these sort of echo chambers. The, the AI would figure out, oh, all these people are like this, 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 this. That's well delivered. And this would happen again and again and again in less than a minute. So when you have hundreds and hundreds of distributions to thousands and thousands of people in that fast a period of time, you're talking about that being computer driven. So those are components of it that, um, that uh, Oh, we have to understand how fake news and, and in particular how uh, its applications for AI work. 
there's a lot to this. You know, people have not trusted uh, the American media and the American government, I mean, forever. You know, one of my favorite quotes is, um, there's no... Uh, there's no native institute of uh, American Institute of Corruption, less Congress, and that was written by Mark Twain. You know, so I mean, this distrust and dislike and disbelief uh, is historic in American society. Uh, you know, since the beginning. I mean, that's how we were founded, and our Constitution was written. Our political culture is that way. So there's a lot of that distrust. The issue that we have, and that we, we need to address on fake news. Um, is how it's organized against us, whether it's nation state support, whether it's organizational, whether it's propaganda that we can track to a nation state, whether it's being covertly done, whether it's done by individuals, by media, etc. We need to understand it. We need to understand who's doing what. And by and large, I think Americans are getting, I, 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 two years ago I would have been a lot more pessimistic on the outlook on losing a democracy. But the democracy is very, fairly resilient, the American democracy is. Other parts of the world, I would agree with you, they'll, they, they, they run the risk of losing their democracy. But you know what? We have one great strength that has actually prepped us a lot towards fake news. <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying it. But that is Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Two years ago, if I had asked you about fake news, you were like, eh, yeah, I've heard here and there about it. Last year, when I gave a presentation on it, people were like, okay, that's kind of scary that would happen. And what have you heard relentlessly every day in the press for, for over a year now? It's fake news, it's fake, it's fake, it's fake, it's fake. How many of you actually trust the news? I mean, like zero. It's you know, the <laughs> first time Americans have actually been forced to say, hey, wait a minute. I got to look at it. I don't know what's real or not. And, and actually, that's a good thing. Good thing to get our population going in that you know, direction, skeptical and questioning everything. Sorry, it took so long. No worries. I'm bad to respond to this next challenge. Uh -uh. <laughs> throw down, throw down. That's a different so, interpretation of facts, but go on. No, not this uh, out. So, just a couple of things. Nick challenged my use of percentages. I'll be happy to cite my sources. I would be welcome Nick to cite his sources. According to the Pew Research Center study of 2016, around 62% of Americans got some of their news from social media. In a 2017 study, which is the one I'm citing, 67% of Americans got their news, some of their news, some percentage of their news from social media. Some percentage of their news. That's right, that's what I said. Okay. Is that, that's exactly what I'm saying. Is that 2% or 92%? 2% hmm? yeah. or 92%? I think I gave you the courtesy of avoiding the Sorry, sorry. Thank you so much. Thank you. I appreciate it. Don't make me take it down. Thank you. <laughs> For age, in 2016, for ages 18 to 49, which I think you know, most of the people on this panel fall into, <laughs> I'm not going to judge, you know, I'm, I'm back on the Fake news. We have 78% in 2016 and the same percentage in 2017. For people 50 plus, we have 45% in 2016 and 56% in 2017. The numbers will likely keep going in this direction. So we have a clear increase, not decrease, in the number of people getting their news from social media. According to other research on the topic of fake news and Donald Trump, that sh there's very clear indication that Donald Trump has caused a very significant <coughs> decrease of trust in the media. If we look at trust in the media in 2015, we have Americans expressing, 40% of Americans expressing trust in the media. In 20, next year, in 2016, we have 32% of Americans expressing trust in the media. Now, the number among Democrats stayed the same. The number among Republicans fell by around 50% uh, from something like 32% trusting the media to 14% trusting the media. We have a very clear result of Donald Trump undermining, undercutting trust in mainstream media and driving people to use social media more as a source of their news. So we clearly, I very much would have to disagree with the trajectory that Nick has been. I think the trajectory is clearly downward, not upward. 
So we have more people using social media. We have less trust in in the news as in the mainstream media. We have a huge problem. It's not getting better. It's getting worse. We have it coming. This problem is getting even worse, considering that what's called deep fakes, which are fake videos, videos that look very, very, very realistic. In terms of if you see, if you really would struggle a lot to tell apart an actual video from a fake video, and they've been they're starting to get spread around. It will get much worse. The problem is getting much worse. It's not getting better. And our democracy is gravely threatened by the situation. Well, Alex Jones, um, when he was sued over some things that had uh, come up in his uh, television show, claimed that he was an entertainer as a way to get out of being responsible for his uh, statements. So what are the responsibilities of journalists? Is it to their stockholders? Is it to the media in, or to the public in general? Is it to um, yeah. You're talking about an issue of integrity, and I don't know where that is for journalism. I mean, say the issues of 40 percent, 30 percent. 40 percent is pretty low. You know? I mean, even before this era, it's not a lot of trust in the media. So I, I don't even know where that is anymore. I just, you know, it's a cultural thing. I have no answers on that. I mean, I, I would say, I mean, I don't, it's hard for me to say who they should be, you know, responsible to because there's a complicated series of things. Like they have responsibility to their readers, but they don't, shouldn't let their readers decide what their content is going to be and how they cover a story. Uh, they have responsibility to their bosses and they have responsibility to themselves and they have responsibility to each other and they have responsibility to their sources. Um, I would say, though, that it's, it's better to look at it than that journalists should be transparent about their process and also take uh, challenges to their reporting seriously. If somebody says, I think you got this wrong, the reporter's response should be like, no, I got it right, and not actually go back and check their facts. They actually should go back and check their facts, come out and say, listen, I did get this wrong. Here are the steps that happened in my reporting to get it wrong, and here are the steps I took to get it right. I think that sort of transparency in what you're doing. And you know, certainly reporters are gonna to come to uh, the reporting they do with a certain amount of bias, whether that's because of their employer or because of the style of their publication or, or you know, who their city is. A reporter who covers San Francisco is gonna cover it differently than you know, a story than somebody who covers, say, one of Texas or something. Like, it's just a different set of issues and different sets of responsibilities. But being transparent about those biases, I think, is really important. Do you think that that absolves them of the responsibility to some central ideal of truth if they declare biases? Because studies do show that the declaration of bias doesn't necessarily mean that that we weigh that information differently. We may, we may actually counter uh, compensate. I mean, I feel like journalism is a big tent, and there's certainly room for reporting, like say the Associated Press does, that has a very strict style guide and very strict standards about how they approach stories. But I also think there's room for, within journalism, for the Mother Jones, uh, Joneses of the world, who are clearly writing for a liberal audience, and they're, that's where they're coming from it. But I don't think you can look at, at, at Mother Jones and say they're not doing excellent reporting. I mean, they were the ones who busted the, 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 you know, the Mitt Romney story during the, the 2012 election that dominated the cycle for weeks. So what would an ideal situation be? And, and like who would pay the journalists? Who, how would the journalists make a living? Would they be crowdsourced? Wow, what, what I wish I had that idea? answer and then I could save yeah. all of journalism. Well, that's why I asked the question. Are we going to save the world? I mean, I guess they all should have invested in Bitcoin in 2009 and cashed out you know, last year. I mean, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I like some of the donor models out there. I mean, I, you know, I, I feel like I've hit the lottery in the sense that I've moved from journalism to an organization that both does uh, a certain amount of investigative reporting, does a lot of uh, Freedom of Information Act requests and lawsuits, um, and also defense journalists. But I mean, it's much different for us to be part of a, uh, it feels a lot different to be part of an organization that is funded by members who maybe are paying the same as they would a newspaper subscription, but feel like they are part of our organization as members as opposed to subscribers to our organization. And I think that uh, when I, you know, talk to newspapers, I often like, you know, you need to start thinking about the people in your community and your subscribers as members and have them buying into what you do, right? that they are supporting journalism, that they are part of the ability of, of 
that they are facilitating news and reporting by being subscribers, by contributing to it. And I think that works out much better. I think you look at publications like ProPublica that are doing very well, and Voice of San Diego on the local level, that by sort of embracing this member dynamic and this nonprofit dynamic, and going for like, looking at like far out, not like what can we do in two years, but what can we do in 10, and that has resulted in quite a bit of stability. I just want to jump back on what you just said. This sounds like it speaks to the broader kind of uh, incentives and economic dynamics that uh, you also brought up a little earlier. It's kind of like, where are the incentives of the reporters, and who really wants the commodity of news, the commodity of what reporters produce. So kind of like, you know, I want the pen, you know, last week I shot for the pen, I slapped the logo on it, you know, I was just like, you know, why is it cheaper and we get it faster to me, right? So where is it with news? So why is the news transitioning to the subscription model? Because there are fewer subscriptions, obviously, to paper, news, paper newspapers, right? So then, if, you know, if I live in Columbus, Ohio, so the dispatch is, the Columbus dispatch is the newspaper record. So yeah, I can, you know, ask if I want to read more than a few articles, I need to pay. So there, the financial straits in which the many news organizations are, are, you know, no secret for us here, and it's a decline, and it's a struggle for this industry. So who really needs it and who supports it? And so we have the problem with comments if anyone studied, uh, economics and kind of that's what happened during the environmental movement when you know people were like fresh air or whatever I don't care and then at some point you know we started to care that you know we want fresh air but there was not incentive for people to keep it clean so for the polluting organizations they had an incentive because they could manufacture more or whatever the case may be but the incentive for me as a person was to breathe fresh air there was nothing I could do so, so it's kind of this problem that people are not incentivized to protect a common resource, like the air, water, clean soil, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So the Poetry's Pledge, one of the reasons we started it, is because we're trying to improve, increase trust in society and push back against all these dynamics that we're discussing here in this panel to promote truthfulness and to create incentives that people are incentivized to be truthful, incentivized to, to, to do these behaviors, both uh, private citizens and <coughs> public figures like all of us here alike and many of you in the audience. So that kind of goes to, to journalists. Like, is it a nonprofit situation where foundations, generous individuals fund them? And I've spent a career in the nonprofit sector and I'm running a nonprofit right now. Let me tell you, funding money is hard, as I'm sure you know. You guys know, in a nonprofit, and at the university, the same. So many nonprofits are funded by governments. Do we want government funding? So I guess I don't have an uh, answer, but I'm just here to pose questions, kind of in a bigger, kind of in the in the bigger situation that we're in. What is this commodity? Who's going to pay for it? And how is this going to be set up? So are we going to depend on the generosity of a few? people, organizations, and foundations to have trustworthy journalism because we depend on that for our cultural you know, institutions and museums and things like that. So where are the incentives and who's going to pay for the stuff that supports our democracy and supports uh, functioning society? Well, speaking of questions, we have a microphone here. If anyone has any, please come up and um, make sure your questions in the form of a question. Uh oh. <laughs> Howdy. Come on, so just bring it. to this point between uh, the two of you about the, this news on social media, right? the, the numbers of people getting news on social media in and of itself means exactly nothing. What matters, as I believe Nick pointed out, is what news are they reading on social media. Now, I agree with the implications of what you're talking about, that probably there is an increase in lousy sources being repeated on social media. And we can look at those correlations. That's what we should be looking at. I agree. But, a, but, but there was a time when I thought, I'm never going to read my newspaper on a computer screen. You've got to be out of your mind. I'm sure I said that to people. I'm sure I said those words. And yet, I haven't touched a hard copy of the New York Times or the New Yorker magazine in more years than I can remember. Okay, and yet I read those two publications, among many, daily, right? 
So the simple fact of whether it's on social media or not says nothing about what's being read on social media. And yes, I link to articles in the New York Times and the New Yorker on, heaven forbid, social media. That says that doesn't tell us anything. So again, the implications of what you're talking about, let's talk about the quality of the news. And yes, the fact that social media does echo bad sources. And the point, and just to just be even-handed, the only the one thing I would disagree with you on is at the end to simply blanketly say that Trump has, you know, in some supposedly valued, valid or valued way, increased skepticism in the media. Sorry, I'm not going there with you because when you get a blanket distrust of be it media or government, a blanket distrust where people say everything is fake news including what we know to be respons responsible germs. Okay, the, the notion that more and more people should, should uh, paint the media, the paint journalists with the same brush, be they from the New York Times or from the Nazi daily you know, outlet, that's not good for democracy. Oh, I'm going to name my rock band, Nazi Daily Outlet. That's a really good point, uh, Jamie. I think so what she highlighted to me is a little bit of a failing on, of, a failing of other minds on my part. So there's a lot of information I know that they didn't have a, I guess I didn't share accurately and adequately. We have studies showing that false news, fake news, spreads about 10 times further and faster on social media than real news. Is that because it's, it's often designed to spread? Exactly. You're yeah, exactly right, David. So it's designed to spread this way and be, because people most people, over 50%, according to studies, 54%, share an article based just on the headline and image alone. So if you make the headline grabby and the image emotionally evocative, you're going to get spread. And of course, fake news can make that easier because they don't have to stick to truthfulness in their headline or the image. So that's one big problem. Second big problem, so we have the Definitely false news, fake news, which I mean complete lies, spreads faster, faster and further in social media. Another study showed that in the 2016 election, the last three months before the 2016 election, compared the top 20 fake news stories from truthful sources and uh, false sources. Truthful sources from Wall Street Journal to New York Times and false fake news and so on. Top 20 uh, news stories that were shared. It found that the top 20 True news stories got 6 million plus engagements on Facebook, which is likes, comments, and shares. Found that the fake news, top 20 fake news stories, got 7 million engagement, likes, comments, and shares. So there's no question, according to the studies, according to the research, that social media is full of false news, fake news, likely, and that they're much more highly shared than true news which makes the fact that more and more people, year by year, and age groups are using social media to get their information, devastating for our democracy, devastating for the way that we're able to get news. It's tough, too, on, on social media, um, like so folks like David Avocado Wool, who, uh, yeah, yeah, don't get me started on that. But anyway, so, <laughs> so that was a personal insult, not a libelous statement. I can't stand it. Anyway, so the problem is. not he, fake news, Ann. <laughs> well, okay, so I'm a physician, as y'all probably know, or maybe don't, but whatever. So the point is that he will slip nonsense medical advice in amongst all these pretty flowers and happy sayings. And so people will come in for the, for the adorableness and then they leave with bullshit. And I've got a great big problem with that because people suffer and die when they ignore sound medical advice from their own personal position and take it from some jackass on the internet. And so, so this whole fact, I'm sorry, well, I have to talk like a truck driver. But anyway, so the point is that. So I love you. <laughs> well, the point is that that's one of the reasons why it's so important to get to the root of number one, how do we stop this propagation and, and substitute the real thing. Now you quoted Mark Twain. Um, I, I like his quote about, you know, a lie can travel around the globe yeah. um, before the truth even has its boots on. Well, here's the thing. That statement of the earliest attribution was in 1919, but he died in 1910. So that could be fake news too, but it's still a true statement. I mean, that's still a true statement, even if it's not really him that said it. 
As Thomas Jefferson said, we need to be very truthful on social media. On the internet, yeah. <laughs> 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 well, that's your George Washington. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> Thank you for hey, coming. <laughs> Next question, please. On, on a more serious note, just a oh. minor thing. The slipping fake news among pretty pictures of flowers actually the exactly the same tactics that Russian troll farms are using to misinform Americans. Like, create, for example, there was a site called uh, something like AmericanVets.com or something like that. And they were sharing real stories about how veterans could get health care and so on. From, and they were also sharing fake news about how Donald Trump is the greatest and Hillary Clinton is a liar, liar, liar. Happened to find out later that it was run by a Russian troll farm. Well, so it's, it's this, obviously very effective. It's a very effective tactic. So anyone can use it, whether it's you know fake doctors or fake. Find some cute or pictures on my phone right now. Yeah, we need some cat pictures. <laughs> Slide more. Okay, next question. Well, as we're discussing the propagation of fake news, I think we need to distinguish between what is truly untrue news versus that which is. Uh, has a polit obvious political slant or comes from a particular source because we've always had partisan news, sometimes explicitly partisan news, such as in the days of the American colonies and the early formation of the U.S. Constitution, which news sources weren't explicitly Federalist or explicitly anti-Federalist. And then you had yellow journalism in the early 1900s, and then now things that the pendulum's kind of swung back in a similar direction with the large news outlets where they may more often take a certain stance and then people say, oh, they're left, they're right, and so I don't trust them, or I do trust them unequivocally, depending on where you're at. So then, as we're searching for the truth, how can we then distinguish in, these, in the statistics and in our own lives between that which is truly factually incorrect news versus that which is just politically slanted? Because when Trump first uh, brought up the term fake news, it was specifically geared towards stories that were unflattering of him that he did not like, which is not the same as what we appear to be talking about. So within the context of what we're talking about, how can we then individually and statistically take that into account, what's factually inaccurate versus what is just slanted? Yeah, sure thing. I think that's a great question. And I think that there's fake news like, uh, you know, there's you know, humans never landed on the moon, they did. So, you know, so it's a lie, it's a lie. But it's another thing that Donald Trump, not just during the election, but almost like nearly once a week, they, he goes in and says, oh, New York Times, that's fake news, oh, CNN, that's fake news. So if you just keep doing that, then you will label truthful news as fake news, and that confuses people and decreases trust. And there are many, uh, Oh, what's passing you know, an excellent website, uh, mediabiasfactcheck.com. And one reason that I'm comfortable bringing them up is because the organization itself signed the pro-truth pledge and signed up to you to follow these 12 behaviors that are in the sheets or cards in front of you and that you can, of course, uh, commit to follow yourself. So these are the behaviors that lead us to the truth and to the facts, not just like, oh, this is my truth, you know, God exists, so it doesn't exist, but we can't check, you know? But is this phone here? Yes, we can check. Is this card here? Yes, we can check. And the pro truth pledge has guidelines for if you know it's either a fact like two plus two is four, or it's something that's been verified by a, a list of certain fact checking information. Some and uh, the other one is of course uh, scientific consensus. And of course, one of the behaviors here is that we clarify, distinguish between opinion and the facts. And I think this goes back to the question and comment that was before is that like when I was in high school they taught us what's the difference between opinion, what's the difference between a fact. And actually it wasn't a very easy lesson and I just wonder if that's something that's being taught anymore very often. And that it's it's very difficult. A lot of times I'm reading an opinion, you know, and I'm like, oh I, this is totally true, but no, it's an opinion. It's an opinion. A lot of the stuff that's out there is an opinion, it's not an actual fact. So here just a few things to pick up. Thanks for a great I would, I would, so things that I, I do when I, well, so first general rules, if I see a news story and it just seems so deliciously ironic or outrageous or something, I'm like, if I'm excited about it because it's like, oh, it's just, you know, like, I sort of like, let's take a breath and let's think about it, let's see what else is out there. I tend to, like, when I see a story, I want to go back and find the original source of it. Oftentimes what you'll see is, like, say, there'll be, like, a slate story and it'll have one headline 
And once you actually start reading the story, you realize they are saying, well, this was all reported by this publication. And so then you click the link over, and then actually that publication was reporting something, say, from like the Wall Street Journal. And then I'll go back to the original Wall Street Journal story, and I'll see this actual telephone game play out where something was misinterpreted just a little bit by the first publication, and then misinterpreted even more by the second publication. And so I feel like it's important. I could spend a lot of time going back to the original records of things. If I see somebody publish a report that is referring to a document that they haven't published the document, that is always suspicious to me. But if they do publish it, I usually open it up and look at it and make sure that this person knows what they're doing when they're reading a legal brief or reading a bill of text or reading something like that. It has uh, journals all the way down. What's that? It's journals all the way down. <laughs> Next question. Okay, I, would, I hope that one or all of you are willing to address the question of what can happen even with responsible journalists who are supposed to be trying to do a good job but where you have the problem of what I will call fake balance, where there will be uh, a scientist from MIT saying that cigarette smoking is bad for you, and a journalist will write an article about it, but then for balance, they would feel they would have to get an opposing opinion on that, which would come from the Tobacco Research Institute. Now, that obviously is an old issue, but it is still happening today with evolution, where an article on teaching evolution will have both real scientists and people from the Discovery Institute as though they were equals. And that's happening all the time and very consequentially where global warming is concerned. And the whole business of this appears to be wonderful and fair and balanced. And what you are do doing is that you're balancing people who are working hard with actual facts, and yeah, I use that word, facts, uh, versus people who are lying. And they are treated as equals. And, you know, am I interviewing a solar physicist? Am I interviewing a, a meteorologist? Am I interviewing a geologist? Am I interviewing a climatologist? Every one of them has something to say about climate change. And every one of them has a perspective they're coming to the table with. Every one of them has blinders on because, you know, this field involves so many different sciences. So I, I can see the challenge for anyone reporting on that type of issue. I mean, do I pick the biologist or do I pick the meteorologist for this eight-second sound bite and that's all it can be? And, and you're inevitably, no matter what, you're going to come out with a wrong answer. You're going to come out with a biased article, no matter even if it's unintentional. So, okay, uh, okay, the mic is on. But what if you make the balance between oh, a climatologist or a biologist or anything like that on the one hand, and on the other hand, somebody from the oil industry or somebody from the Heartland Institute, which is a front for the oil industry. That's the kind of balance I'm talking about. That happens all the time. Right. So you're and talking so about intentionally. No, I don't think the journalists are being intentionally misleading. But there are plenty of organizations that will be happy to intentionally mislead you. And treating them as the equals to scientists who spend 10 years working on a subject is not an exercise in balance, if by balance you mean informing people as to what is really happening. I feel like context is important, like you're going to do that. Like I feel like. If you're talking about the politics of climate change, I don't think you should ignore the fact that there is a very powerful oil lobby and to find out what the oil lobby is telling people. But you should also include with whatever you know remark, garbage, or otherwise they're putting out there saying, this is how much this industry is worth and this is how much they've spent on lobbying Congress. Like actually putting it in the context of what this means to this, what their interests are that, that are underlying the claim they're making. I'm actually I feel it interesting. I think one of the things we need to think about is whether we want to give these people a platform. So one of the behaviors of the pro truth pledge is compassionately inform those around me to stop using unreliable sources even if these sources support my opinion. I think the using sources that have been demonstrably unreliable, for example, tobacco lobbyists saying that tobacco smoking cigarettes doesn't cause cancer. That's just putting this information out there. Now we know from psychological studies that the more these statements are repeated, 
the more people will believe them, even if they're put in the context of, of uh, debunking. So for example, one of the worst offenders of this is the Washington Post Five Myths article. You know, they run a weekly column saying, here are the five myths, here's debunking. Research on this type of reporting shows that when you put the myths and then debunking, you actually reinforce the myths. Mm -hmm. People remember the myths stronger. They don't remember the debunking. So I'm gonna push back a little bit. I'm gonna say that you should not give a platform to myths. You should not give a platform to these people unless you're specifically writing a story about how the tobacco lobby or the oil and gas lobby is putting out bullshit to try to convince the public to you know, support their industry. Just because of the research on this topic and how people think. We need to, one of the things that I deeply frustrated with about the media, about reporting in general, is that the media doesn't align its reporting with the way people actually read the news, with the psychology of how people actually consume information and how they remember information. It's one of the, you know, one of the big, my big pet peeves and one of the big problems of the media is the way that they frame the information in such a way that people take away their own impression. And I think that's a big thing that can fundamentally change. And this is one of the examples that I think should be changed. This is one of the reasons the approach of pledge is framed the way it is. Each of these behaviors is based on psychology of how we actually consume information and how do we actually fight problematic consumption of information and problematic provision of information by media figures, journalists, public lobbyists, talking heads like the people here. <laughs> so do you think that, that we as consumers can can call them on this on the Fake stuff enough that we can change their behavior? Absolutely, that's what the project pledge is about. Yeah. I mean, the but thing that's about. sort of a collective thing. I mean, individuals. Can we as individuals yeah. affect enough of a change? Yeah, so what you would do is you would tell the journalist, hey, how about you take the pro truth pledge and then you would hold the journalist accountable? <laughs> no, that's, that's, a, that's the beauty of it. That's what people do. So this is a very effective mechanism to change people's behaviors, to hold them accountable. I can tell you that I've seen this, the data where a tweet gets uh, in, uh, uh, attention from companies a lot more quickly than um, an email, because emails are a thousand emails, but a tweet it only takes like seven or so on average before they pay attention. And whenever I've tweeted a Delta, there are literally only four people watching that Twitter feed and they have almost always responded. And um, um, I'm going to take one second, personal privilege, moderated privilege, but again, physician. So, I, there, at Vagisil, uh, not Vagisil, but um, some of these medication, something, I can't remember which one, which might have been Monoset, came out with an ad saying that, it, that in vaginal yeast infections, that it, wor it worked better than Vagisil. Vagisil is not a treatment for yeast infections at all. I mean, it's not even the same. It's not even close. It's like a topical anesthetic, and the other actually has an antifungal in it. And so I wrote a letter and emailed the company. It's like one of the only times I've ever. I'm like, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Take that stuff off the television because you're misleading customers. It disappeared, and I don't know if a lot of people responded. I didn't hear anything more about it, but I never saw that ad again. And so. Um, if enough people write in or whatever, you know, I mean, I'm not slamming Vagisil or Monistat, whatever, you know, it's their ad people, they did that. But, but the, yeah, but if you tweet or if enough people do a thing, then, then it might be enough to get attention and maybe get some behaviors changed. We've had multiple candidates sign because we tweeted to them or because an opponent signed, signed the pro truth pledge, like an underdog, and tweeted to their opponent and say, I signed the pro truth pledge, why don't you want to, like, on a facts and truth, they're like, oh, I'm fine, I signed. <laughs> I go in and I'm like, oh, they sign. Three minutes later, so, you know, that's the upside of social media. That's good. That's good. Next question? Yeah. Um, earlier, uh, really early in, in this discussion, uh, there was a question, or you started talking about uh, sort of what international sources of news you were reading, um, and you brought up, you know, British, Canadian, um, Al Jazeera, and I noticed that all the sources that you were citing were English-speaking. And you're probably, the Russian speakers are also reading various publications that are in Russian. And it was occurring to me that, you know, a lot of people, especially Americans, who tend to be less bilingual than other people in other nations, are missing out on a lot of coverage, um, you know, fact-based and fake news-based, um, by not being able to monitor it. I know that, you know, I speak German, and I read the German press all the time because their coverage of American politics is fantastic. It's actually really, really savage. Um, and it's, yes. it's great. You're just reading it and you're like, 
did they just say, wow? <laughs> but um, I was wondering, you know, how, how important it is and how, how, what the impact is, you know, as far as the consumers here and, and readers in the United States because they don't really have um, the ability to, you know, as, as to read, you know, anything that's not in English so much. Um, you know, there's many, many Spanish speakers, of course. Um, and also to not be able to read stuff in translation even because it's not being readily translated and how does that impact them and not knowing what opinions are in other countries or how they're being seen or you know what are, what are the other people how are the other people uh, in other other places whether you know it's Asia or Eastern Europe reporting on the news um, what are they saying about Trump or what are they saying about NATO or whatever? Um, I know that's been really valuable to me just to be able to read German and I'm like, well, I wish you could read Italian. I wish I still could speak Russian. I studied it a long time ago, but I can't anymore. Now I can just read the words out loud, but I don't know what they say. Um, and I, I get notifications from Le Mans, but I can't understand them. <laughs> so, I, I love it when the Spiegel is translated into English. I, I think you're absolutely right, and I, I love I, I love when I find translated stuff. In the there, there's a there's a there's Spiegel English section, but yeah. they, they, it's only certain articles. Yeah, I know. They, I mean, occasionally they have like a big investigative piece, and they'll yeah. translate it. And it's like yes. So he found mm -hmm. it helpful. Oh yeah. 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 I mean, I mean, there's different cultures of journals depending on what country you're, you're in. But I mean, there's definitely some very strong traditions of uh, journalism in, in Germany and France. And, you know, Are there different, different styles in the different um, international um, reporters, reportings? I mean, I wouldn't say I'm an expert on this, but I would say, I mean, certainly, yeah. I think I'm going to say not so much. <laughs> And I do read in Chinese, I read in Long, and um, sometimes in Greek newspapers well, you don't as well. Have to read it to me. Okay. But it seems to be pretty well the same. And I'm not an expert in either, but it seems to be pretty well the same. But that, that's more the issue of our lack of access to information than it is big. You know, it's just that's how much information you have. If you have nothing to do all day but read, you have that much information. You know, so no matter what, you're limited somewhere. Okay, I think we're going to have time for probably one more question, and then we'll do our shameless plugs. I hate to be the last question. Um, well, we'll see. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm in charge of a number of pre-service science teachers, um, and I was just wondering if you guys have any advice to science teachers who are trying to promote critical thought and analysis of sources in their science students. So with the Brochure Pledge, we have a number of teachers who are developing curricula themed around the Brochure Pledge. You can come up and chat about that later. What they tend to do is take each of the behaviors and have a week devoted to it, have some uh, articles, readings about that, then have students write a blog or create a podcast around that behavior, around the reading. So it's actually a part of the curriculum and it fits the uh, standards. Of course, the main thing that we want to do is make sure it fits the standards. We are very uh, careful about not adding to the burdens of teachers. So, you know, having it be part of the curriculum in a way that fits their needs. And that fits it very well because it's 12 weeks, you know, 12 behaviors. So that's a specific thing that I can talk about and we can talk about it after the presentation. But basically the approach with pledge itself, if you look at the 12 behaviors, that is the essence of critical thinking and media literacy. The first eight behaviors, the last four behaviors are how those you can bring that to your community. So it's, called, it's impacting what's called the network effect, where you can change people around you just by your behavior and how you change uh, other people around you. Getting students at that level interested in truthfulness and how you think about each of the components of critical thinking and media literacy of these behaviors has been quite effective. Well, it looks like we might be able to squeeze one more question. I'm going to make it a quick one, right to the question. Um, I'm a local educator also. Um, I'm history, not science. And, and actually, that piggybacks right on, right on the question that I had for you all, um, which is that um, with critical thinking, do you think that the public schools in America at this point have failed at, to teach critical thinking and consumption of information habits? And if so, why specifically? And then you just addressed kind of what you would do about it and how you would approach it. I was wondering if any of you others have thoughts on that as well. Yeah, actually I do. Um, and, and I have had the opportunity to see a lot of school systems having lived overseas much of my career and having kids in school. So I've, I've had a bit of exposure to it. And actually I think we do it 
reasonably good job. We certainly don't do a great job, but um, we do a reasonably good job. There are other places in the UK, they, they teach a lot more agile thinking and addressing problem issues. Um, I would say not in China, not in Japan, uh, but the US is sort of be maybe uh, up in that area, but we could do a lot more. You know, we teach so much in individualism and, and, and uh, not so much in, in that critical thought process. It is something that needs to be addressed for, you know, the problem is easy, folks. Start at elementary school, middle school, changes to really a focused critical thinking, you know, uh, uh, society, and in the next generation or two, they're going to be doing pretty well, I think. Okay, 10 seconds each for shameless plugs. Sorry, uh, we've got a panel coming up later in the week, a uh, similar topic where I will be interviewing Arturo Garcia for Snopes. Uh, we also have a, uh, Electronic Frontier Foundation has a table over here on the second floor uh, where we are teaching people to make strong passwords using giant 20-sided dice. Yes. Awesome. You'll have the brochure pledge in front of you. This paper with this button, with this uh, button. It will take you 30 seconds to vote out. You will make a tangible difference to fighting this information fake news. We've got four members of Congress, potentially yours, and over 30 state legislators who signed because private citizens like yourself have signed. We've come to them, we say, here is how many of your constituents signed. So sign it with your email, with your address, with your phone in case we can't read your email or address. And that's how we will actually change things around here and not just sit here and talk about how bad fake news is. To follow up on that, after you sign the pledge, or if you have any questions about it, you come over to our table, approach the pledge, it's in the back of this level of the Hilton. Also check us out on social media, approach the pledge. And I hope to chat to many of you later because I will be spending most of the next few days at the table. <laughs> okay, pass them up to us after you sign them or leave them on the back table to the right when you leave. Uh, I do have a lecture coming. I think it's Sunday on uh, critical thinking and how we uh, design that process in the intelligence community. And actually try to go through some analytical techniques called analytical tradecraft you can use. And, and I believe I'll also post that on my blog as well. So take it, use it, make it part of your life, and uh, you know, hopefully you'll find it valuable. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for coming. We'll see you all.